A well, warm welcome to today's talk. Now I'm going to give you the essence of this talk in about the first four or five minutes. And then if you want to watch the whole thing, you can. Now it's based on this question here. Uh, this is from Sarah. Uh, John, please could you review this article from Israel's National News? It says the risk of myocarditis following mRNA COVID vaccine is around 133 times greater than the background risk. Is this true? Um, and if it is true, why is it not all over mainstream media? Well, to deal with that last bit first, um, I don't know why mainstream media don't seem to report on these things more than they do. You would think it would be a legitimate part of informed comment. So I don't know the answer to that one. You'd have to ask the director general of the various mainstream media outlets and their people in charge. But let's just clarify the question here. This is it here, new study, uh, and it does say 133 times risk of myocarditis after COVID vaccination. And uh, to answer this question, of course, because we have to just go by exactly what the evidence says, we have to go to the actual study here where this originated from. So this is the study this actually originated from, and it's in the um, it's in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association. You can download the PDF. It's all available free, which, of course, is very generous and the whole thing is there now to be fair it's not a very easy read so i'm just going to sort of um i'm just going to give you a sort of a quick pre-say of this a, a summary of it and you can decide whether you want to listen to the rest or not um is there 133 times greater risk um it's actually probably much more significant than that but what we know from the data my calculations at least uh, it's 84 times increased risk in the higher risk category of uh, young men and adolescents. Now, why am I saying it's actually 84 times the risk based on the data? Uh, but why am I saying it's probably more than 133 times the risk? In other words, that this is an underestimate of risk. Well, there's fairly strict criteria for diagnosing a case of myocarditis and indeed pericarditis, so fairly strict criteria. So it's conceivable that some people have an inflamed myocardium, then therefore by definition myocarditis, might not meet the criteria. That, that, that could be few, could, true of some cases. Um, many cases, of course, are, are simply not reported. People simply don't report the case. How many, we have no idea. Now, this is all based on VRAS data, the, the, the Vaccine uh, Adverse Events Reporting System in the United States. And I've looked at this, and it's, it, though it says that anyone can fill out a VRAS return, really, you've got to be quite a specialist clinician to do it. I mean, I, I, I had to think about it, and I'll show you why it's complicated before. So we can conclude that there's an increased risk of uh, myocarditis and pericarditis after the mRNA vaccines. We can say that definitely. Can we say that it's caused by the vaccine? Technically, the paper doesn't claim that. It says there's an increased risk after the vaccine. So you'll have to decide uh, yourself whether it's a causal link or not. The paper doesn't claim, doesn't claim it's a causal link. It just says there's an increased risk, which is, is patently the case. So if you want to carry on watching, do. Um, uh, it, is, it is pretty uh, pretty interesting paper. Now, um, myocarditis cases reported after that. This, that's the name of the paper there. U.S. data uh, from the 20th of December to August 2021. So uh, there's, a good, there's a good few months of data there. That, that's, that's good. Paper published just on the 25th of January. Now, I've just put this list of people in here so you can see where these people are working. This is a very uh, prestigious source. So a lot of people work for the CDC. Uh, School of Medicine and Moore University, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, uh, etc. Pretty prestigious uh, institutions and a, a long list of authors. So this paper carries quite a lot of credibility. Uh, this is the actual reference that JAMA like you to cite, so I've done so. Uh, that's their actual reference. Now this is important because vaccinations against COVID-19 provide clear public health uh, benefits according to the paper. Uh, but vaccination also carries potential risks. So I think both fairly obviously true statements there to kick off. Uh, the risk and outcomes of myocarditis after COVID-19 vaccination are unclear, according to this paper. So they're actually saying that it's still unclear. That's why this needs clarified, which is, of course, is what they're attempting to 
carry out uh, on the on with, with this uh, with this paper. Um, where am I? There we are. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> uh, to describe reports of myocarditis and the reporting rates after mRNA-based COVID-19 vaccines in the United States. So that, that's what this is about. Now, it's a descriptive study. Reports from myocarditis um, to the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, VERA. So it depends on this reporting, and it's a passive system. So if this complication comes up, or any complication comes up from the vaccine, people can decide to fill out this VERAS form or not but as i'll show you it's a really quite a complicated form and i know very often when drug complications are come across in in, in the uk uh, it's actually quite a big job to report it so sometimes it's just simply not done um so so really these viras returns are the minimum amount and, and the real number could be much higher but of course i can't say that definitively we, we, we don't know we don't know how often these forms aren't filled out. We, we don't know how often they are filled out. After mRNA-based uh, vaccine, so that, that's what this is about. Now, let's uh, before we look at some uh, interesting graphics, let's look at this. So it's, be it's between those dates, 20 December, 21st of August, in 192 million uh, people older than the age of 12. But, of course, we notice that of this 192 million which is the, the whole number of people probably been vaccinated in this time period. Many of these are much older than the, uh, the age range in which uh, myocarditis is likely to occur. So that figure, you could argue, is, uh, well, it is correct, but it's also, um, remember, it's the younger demographic that's at risk of this. Um, it's virtually unheard of at my age. Uh, this is typically people under under 30 that are affected by this. So here we have some of the data here. So this, this is a vaccination with uh, BNT162B2, which of course the Pfizer vaccine. So up and down here, we've got reported cases of myocarditis after vaccination with Pfizer. Uh, age at onset of myocarditis. So um, the, the, these are years so for example the highest rate here is people that are 16 years of age uh, and that was the number of uh, cases with the Pfizer vaccine until we get to 40 years of age when 39 40 when there's actually very few cases and they don't even bother putting the uh, they don't even bother putting the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s because it is so uncommon um, or virtually unheard of in the, those older age groups so this is so important because we're dealing with young people here and this is the number this is the number for all all young people i'm pretty sure uh, yeah i think that's the number for all young people there so um and this is the uh this is after the moderna vaccine now if we just look at the scales here so that was like 40 60 80 um this is 20 40 60 we see many many less cases with the moderna vaccine so more cases with the pfizer vaccine um, and again, uh, aging years across there. Now, this is vaccination with Pfizer, and this is reported cases of myocarditis after vaccination, and this is days after. Now, this shows that you get a few cases on the first day, but most cases are occurring on the second day. Some on the se second, sorry, mo yeah, for, some on the first day after, most on the second day after, third day after. So most of these cases are occurring the vast majority in the first few days, but virtually all in the first uh, 10 days. So this is shortly after the, uh, the the vaccine dose, more common, of course, after the second dose. And again, with the figures here for, um, let, for first of all, we notice that the, the numbers here, that, so that's 200 line there. Uh, with the uh, Moderna, that's the 80 line there. So it's less common with, with Moderna. But again, similar age, uh, similar not age group, sorry, similar time after vaccination, most common in the first few days um, after the vaccine has been given, most common with the uh, sec after the second dose. Um, now, during the analytic period, uh, Pfizer vaccine, 12 years and older, uh, mRNA vaccines were being given to uh, the... the, the uh, Sorry, the, 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 the Pfizer vaccines were being given to people 12 and older. The Moderna vaccines at this time were only being given to people 18 years and older. So during this time period, that is what, who were being vaccinated. 
So uh, no one was getting the, uh, no, no one between the ages of 12 and 18 were getting the Moderna vaccine during this time period. So that's what they were exposed to, those vaccines. Main outcomes and measures. Expected rates of myocarditis by age and sex were calculated using the 2017 to 2019 data. And that, that's, how we, that's how we get that number. So the, the expected number of cases of myocarditis was in that age group was taken before the pandemic, 2017 to 2019, compared to this 2021 time period when this data was actually collected. Uh, for people younger than 30 years of age, uh, medical records reviews of clinicians interviews were conducted to describe clinical presentations, diagnosis, etc. But of course, these were not always available. The full clinical details were not always available. They were in most cases, but not always available. So the result now, remember, amongst this 192 million uh, people vaccinated, 354 million doses of vaccine, but most of these vaccines of course were given to people over the age of uh, 30 so it's a bit it's a bit misleading that so you know, if we looked actually looked at the number of um, vaccinated people in that age group it will probably be better because as we say the older people are essentially at no risk of this complication so a bit disappointing they didn't break that number down further really uh, th th this this would tend to make the cases look uh, rarer th than they are because this is th these are the cases for the whole population not that particular demographic which was unfortunate that they, they chose to express it like that uh, 1991 reports of uh, myocarditis uh, 1626 met the criteria now how many cases of myocarditis were there uh, we don't know all we know is that many were reported on the the veras system the actual number of cases we don't know. Of those with myocarditis, uh, median age 21, um, interquartile range, in other words, 50% fell between the ages of 16 and 31. So to be fair, 25% of cases there are over the age of uh, 31. So, so um, it's not unheard of in, in slightly older age groups. Median time to symptom onset, as we said, was pretty quick, two days. Males, 82% of cases. Now, it's a pity, well, you could argue it's a pity that the uh, adenovirus vector vaccines, which are associated with a much, much lower risk of myocarditis, uh, were never rolled out in the States. Because it could be, when you actually add up the, the relative risk, that it's safer to give the uh, adenovirus vector vaccines, like the Oxford vaccine, to young men. Because the young men are those ones most at risk. 82% of myocarditis cases, meaning that the other 18%, of course, were uh, in, uh, in females. So the vast majority of cases in young men which, of course, is uh, exactly what we don't want. Now, reporting rates for uh, myocarditis. Uh, within seven days after COVID-19 vaccination, uh, exceeded the expected rates of myocarditis across multiple uh, age and sex strata. So, um, in other words, in an any, any age group, there's more cases of myocarditis than would be expected, and in both sexes, there was an, inc an, inc an increased incidence. So even in young women, there was an increased uh, incidence compared to what had been expected in the was it years 17, uh, 2017 and 2018 or whatever the comparative years were. Rates of myocarditis were highest after the second dose of vaccine, which we've known for a long time. Adolescent males 12 to 15, 70.7 uh, .7 million doses of the vaccine given. And uh, so... 70 sorry 70.7 70 cases of myocarditis per million cases of vaccine given so nearly 71 cases per million vaccine given and i've worked that out as one case in 14,144 um, but again many of the people that were vaccinated were much older and it's not clear. The, the paper's actually not clear whether it's just comparing within its demographic or for everyone. It's not, not really clear on that. Uh, males aged 16 to 17, uh, 105.9 cases per million doses. Uh, that's, that's one case for 9,442. But if we just look at the demographic, 
I think that will be a fair bit higher, is, is my understanding, as my reading of this paper. Males 18 to 24, 52.4 um, million, per million doses. That's one case in 19,000. Um, and uh, 56.3, actually, in that particular age group, it's a bit confusing there. Let's go, let's go by the graphic. That is what it says in the paper, but the graphic indicates that that's not correct. So I'm not quite sure if that's just a fault in the way the paper's written. Anyway, that works out at one case in 17,000 a bit. Now, myocarditis under 30. Uh, 826 cases who had detailed clinical information available. As we said, quite a few didn't have detailed clinical information. And again, we'll see the gaps in the data here become obvious. Um, 792 over 809, 98% uh, eight, had elevated troponins. Now, troponins are associated um, in the heart, there's contractile fibres. That, that cause the heart to contract so it contracts and then relaxes and troponins are part of these uh, contractile fibers and if a heart cell is damaged if a myocyte is damaged these components of the uh the contractile fibers that are supposed to be kept inside the cell get out into the blood and we can it's a sign of, it's a sign of cardiac cell damage basically so it means that um most of them had damage to their myocytes their myocardial cells 72% abnormal uh, electrocardiogram results. And uh, again, there are criteria for this. So the electrocardiogram is just the way the heart is beating. You probably, in the UK, we call it ECG. In the States, they call it EKG. So you have, um, you have a P like that. Then you have a QRS complex like that. And then you have a, a T wave like that. And that they're equal, that they represent the electrical activity going on in parts of the heart. So that is the contraction of the top chambers of the heart, atrial myocardial contraction. This one here, the QRS, so that's P, Q, R, S, is the contraction of the, the QRS complex, is the contraction of the ventricles, the main pumping chamber, uh, chambers. And the T wave is the electrical activity of the main pumping chambers going back to normal. So a normal rhythm's got a PQRST roughly in the right order and the rate is, uh, well, in, no, exactly in the right order and the rate is between 60 and 100 for a sinus rhythm. So that is a normal sinus rhythm. So there's an abnormality of this. 72% um, had cardiac magnetic, re magnetic resonance imaging results. So 72% had uh, MRIs. And the good thing about these modern cardiac MRIs is you can actually see the heart contracting. So it gives you kinetic information about the contractility of the heart, which, of course, can be impeded if there's inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, hospital data, 96% um, <clears throat> were hospitalised. So most, most of these patients were hospitalised, of the ones that were recognised, of course. 87% had resolution of symptoms by uh, discharge from hospital, which I suppose is good. But, of course, that means 13% didn't. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to put this in, in a particular way. 13% didn't. The most common treatment was non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as the most simple one that everyone knows about, of course, is aspirin. The more common one the, these days are ibuprofen in the UK, naproxen, diclofenac. They've probably got different names in, in the States, but these are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are very good analgesics. Um, and... It doesn't mention this, but paracetamol or, or uh, acetaminophen is also good for pericardial pain. Surprisingly, you, you, I used to treat patients with pericardial pain and, and they often responded better to uh, paracetamol, that's acetaminophen or Tylenol, than they did to morphine. Strange, but, but, uh, but absolutely true. Um, anyway, um, th th so th th these, are the, these were the figures for 16 to 17 year olds. Now, I know you can't see this, but that's, uh, that, that, that's the incidence after the first vaccine, which was 7.26. That's the incidence after the second vaccine, which was 105. That gives a total of 113.12 uh, 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 cases, and normally you would expect 1.34 in the same time period. Um, the expected is 1.34. So um, 1.34 divided into 113.2, I get... 84 times more likely but as we say um, the real number is probably way 
higher than that. Now, I don't know how much detail to go into today, but this, this is the supplement that we get. So I'm just going to mention this a little bit because there are some causes for concern here. So presence of one or more new worsening of the following clinical symptoms, chest pain, pressure or discomfort, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, pain with breathing, feeling your heart beat inside your chest, palpitation, syncope is, is fainting. But as well as that, you need to have a histio histiopath pathological confirmation now this would only be detected on post-mortem because i really can't imagine they're doing cardiac biopsies so histiopathology of course is where you look at the heart under the microscope or some of the tissues under the microscope and the idea that you would do that in a in, in a living person is i've never seen it done um, maybe some centers do it so if you're a clinician working in the States and you do do cardiac biopsies on, on living patients, then do let me know. But um, I will be surprised. So, um, but if, if they didn't have that, which they probably wouldn't, then they would need an MRI. So it's, it's getting quite difficult to get to be a confirmed case. So you have to have the presence of one or more of these, fair enough. But then you have to have that, which would probably never happen. Uh, or you have to have an MRI, which can be difficult to obtain. Uh so you had to have a cardiac magnetic resonance imaging finding consistent with myocarditis and troponins. So they're kind of making it a little difficult and no other identifiable causes. To be a probable cause, you need those same things as well. Probable case, rather. So those same clinical track criteria. And um, you also need troponin levels above the upper limit, fair enough. Uh, an abnormal ECG or, or, or uh, rhythm um, consistent with myocarditis, abnormal cardiac function or wall motion, as we said, with MRI or sometimes ultrasound scan uh, or, or, or MRI findings. So they're making it quite difficult and, and to eliminate cases. So you could say they're being exacting, but that, that could mean that some people that are, this could mean that some people with, say, mildly inflamed myocardiums aren't being put forward as a probable or confirmed case. It could mean that. And again, quite difficult to uh, to die. So ST segment or T. I'm not going to go into these, but you can see there's extra criteria there. So ST segment or T wave abnormalities. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just explain the first one, the ST. So um, so so as we said, the norm the normal rhythm is the uh, the P uh, Q R S, and the uh, the T wave. So remember that's P Q. R S T. So an S T abnormality will be an abnormality between there and there. So what you might have, for example, is uh, you'd have a P, a Q R S, and then something like S T elevation like that before the T wave. So th th that 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 would be an abnormality of S. Uh, so the S th that would be the, the S there and the T, the T there. So there would be an abnormality between in those bits. So instead of going down like that it might just go like that so that that but, but the, 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 these are fairly specialized things and uh i'm not going to go into them i'm not going to go into them in detail uh, um it, it just made it does mean mean it's fairly uh, the specific criteria it's not any change in the ecg in other words there's these specific criteria now reports on the uh the veras system it says this on the veras website here uh, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System is a passive reporting system, meaning it relies on individuals to send in reports of their experiences. Anyone can submit a report to VIRAS, including parents and patients. So anyone can do it. Or can they? Because let me just show you the form that needs to be filled out. Now, <clears throat> here we have part of the form here. Um, part of the form. So um, you would have to decide whether there's any anaphylaxis, coagulopathy, COVID-19, death, Guillain-Barre syndrome, Kawasaki disease, uh, multisystem inflammatory system in adults, multisystem inflammatory system in children, myocardial infarction, uh, myopericarditis, narcolepsy, pregnancy, seizure, stroke, transverse myelitis or other. Now, this is not a, a quiz, but how many members of the public would know what the heck that was talking about 
I mean, you might know what anaphylaxis is. There's a severe allergic reaction. You might not. But why should you know that that relates to abnormal clotting of the blood? You wouldn't have a clue. G GBS. How do we even know it stands for Guillain-Barre syndrome, let alone what it is? Kawasaki disease, an inflammatory disease, myocardial infarction, blocking off of part of the heart muscle, myopericarditis, infection of inflammation of the myocardium and pericardium, uh, inflammation of the pericardium and myocardium. Narcole narcolepsy, you're always falling asleep. Seizures, fitting. Stroke is a cerebrovascular, a cerebrovascular accident. Transverse myelitis it is a transverse lesion across the spinal cord. So if that's a spinal cord run, running up and down there, transverse myelitis will be a lesion that goes across that. But, I mean, that's not just not... How could a member of the public fill that out? I don't... They simply wouldn't have the... You know, it's, it's like me doing a, a flight check before take off on an aeroplane, you know, whether the flaps are right. I don't have a clue. Uh, also, you asked uh, that they'd asked you to identify other infections. So the member of the public, it would appear, is expected to know whether the infection was a DNA virus, Coxsackie, Coxsackie virus. I mean, how could you know any of this stuff? You, you know, it's, it's all specialised stuff. Another part asks you to say if there's any rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, systemic lupus, erythematosus, Sir John syndrome or other inflammatory diseases. I mean, how can a member of the public do that? Also, another part of the question here is uh, ST elevation abnormalities, T wave abnormalities, PR depression, atrial supraventricular or ventricular of the mimias, conduction delays or block. Uh, uh, I mean, AV, I mean, that stands for atrioventricular block first degree. Who knows, you know, unless you're a cardiac nurse or a doctor, cardi cardiologist, you're not going to know these things. You know, try these out on an average GP and see if you can remember them. You know, <laughs> you probably w won't be able to. Unless he's done cardiology recently. Uh, or, or another part, decreased left ventricular function, per, you know, pericardial effusion. You know, what is an effusion? Well, an effusion is a collection of fluid, but how, how would you know that? Ejection, fraction, you know, all these things, how would you know them? So how on earth a member of the public could fill out one of these forms? Well, they couldn't. I don't see how they could. I just don't get it. So you, you, you are relying on um, the patient's doctors to fill it out, or, or specialist nurses who have knowledge of these things, but um, the idea that, you know, I actually struggled when I, when I read that. It actually, it, it actually said that um, anyone can submit a report to VRAS, including patients, uh, parents and patients. Um, it would be interesting to know what proportion of these forms were sent in by parents and patients in the individuals, because uh, uh, unless they were clinicians themselves or some sort of medical scientist, I don't see how they possibly could. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I, I don't get that bit. So there we go. Now, the, the last question is, has there been any previous um, myocarditis, pericarditis from other vaccines? And the answer to that is yes. Um, previous vaccination of myocarditis, only smallpox vaccine is the only one then. Amer American military personnel, but that wasn't seven to 12 days after vaccination. So this uh, pericarditis, myocarditis um, does seem to be unique to the mRNA vaccines. And of course, I'm reminded that we talked to one of the leading scientists in Denmark about this, Professor Niels Hoiby, on a video on this channel. And he, report, he compared the incidence of myocarditis in Denmark to Norway. And of course, in Denmark, they are aspirating before injecting. So they stick the needle in and they draw back to make sure they're not in a vessel. And if the blood comes out and they think they're in a vessel, they're not going to give it. So that's in Denmark, whereas in Norway, they don't bother. And he found that there was uh, three times more cases of pericarditis in Norway where they don't aspirate as opposed to Denmark, where they do aspirate, therefore everyone should be, uh, in my view, uh, everyone should be aspirating and eliminate that variable, but that's not being done. Okay, a bit complicated today, so um hope you followed that. So we, we, can, we, can, we can say that there's more myocarditis. Uh, it's increased after vaccination. And uh, the 133 figure times 133 figure we don't have data for, the times 84 figure we do in that particular age group. But for the reasons I've mentioned, it's probably more than 133 times.
So um, what I would appeal um, is uh, for this to be covered more on mainstream media so that people can make informed decisions. That's what this is about, giving information to make uh, informed decisions. And uh, I'm going to leave it there. Okay, thank you for watching.